Welcome to the first chapter of the Digital Music Workshop, Digital Sound Basics. The first chapter here is, um, is meant to be an, in, as an introduction um, to, the, to the topic in general. So um, I'll be covering a few like, very key concepts um, in regards to the topic of making music on a computer, basically through programming. Um, so there's three topics I want to address. So the first one is, uh, is the sample or samples or sampling in general. And the second one is like audio processing and audio synthesis. And the third one is like programming audio. It's about programming audio. So um, as at the very center of, um, of making digital music is um, the sample or samples or sampling. So what does it mean? Um, expressed in words, it basically means um, to transform a continuous signal into a secret um, send a secret into a sequence of discrete numbers so um, in this graph you can actually tell see that there's like this um, black original signal of some sort probably an audio signal but it doesn't it can be any kind of signal um, and that signal um, is then sampled um, into and thereby transformed into individual um, values actually over time here on the x-axis and um, the so this is what the red um, graph actually shows the every dot is a is a sample a sample taken and um, a number essentially on the y-axis and um, and that happens over time so um, if you can tell if you if you look at it um, the the um, the sampled graph looks somewhat similar to the black one but it is much more jaggy and has yeah a lower resolution basically um, to show you how uh, how significant that I can, can actually be so um, there's also this blue graph which um, has a lower sample rate so um, if you look at the time um, the amounts of samples taken is much less than uh, compared to the red one and the the graph that results from this the blue line um, actually almost does not resemble the original black signal anymore so um, this is actually what um, what what happens when you have a low sample rate the original signal for example like a recorded voice or something um, becomes yeah almost not um, connectable to the original um, you know original sound that you that you would hear with your ears so so um, lowering the sampling rate um, is sometimes necessary to you know for performance reasons or for memory you know for saving memory or, or things like this but um, of course it also you know deteriorates and corrupts the original signal at some point so that's what sampling is all about. Um, so probably all of you know this um, this this um, this view of a of a sampled audio file. So this here is, for example, um, a screenshot from Audacity, um, a program to yeah work with digital audio data, um, and they were plotting the all the samples. Or they are plotting all the samples here. Or the program is plotting all the samples on the in this graph they actually t stereo signal so there's like two there's two channels and if you zoom in you can actually see you're resembling something in the in the um, graph you saw earlier um, here each dot is a, is a sample point um, a single sample and um, this this is then um, if you zoom out a little bit it becomes doing you know this um, almost iconic um, wave file shape something something <coughs> So, um, but essentially these samples end up, uh, for example, on your hard drive, um, these recordings, these sampled recordings, um, and they are just a series of, of uh, numbers, basically. Um, normally it's, it's, it's represented in bytes, so, um, so this is a hex dump, a, um, basically just a, a way of, of showing all the... Um, all the every single all these bytes that are um, part of the the audio file um, and here we are looking at a wave file which is a 
quite a common audio format, um, uncompressed audio format. And um, this WAV file is actually exported from Audacity as well. It's actually the one that we were just looking at here. Um, and this WAV file has 16 bits resolution um, on the Y axis. So, um, so every two numbers actually constitute one sample. I'm basically showing this to show that the, or to outline the, the fact that it's all numbers and um, we might not cover this uh, in this workshop, but um, you could also really work directly with those numbers. For example, if you're into something like glitch, um, glitch styles, just going into this original, you know, uncompressed WAV file and just, you know, messing around with a few numbers, you know, with or without knowing what you're doing, um, this could actually create like interesting um, glitches and, and corrupted sounds. So in the end, it's all really just bytes. So samples are, um, uh, there, there are some, um, the resolution in time on the x-axis again, um, the, um, so the, the speed in which um, samples are taken is um, called the sample rate. And, um, and the depth of the resolution, so that's the y-axis now, you know, how, how um, smoothly um, the, the transitions can be represented. Um, that's called the sample depth. And there's a, a series of very common sample rate, sample depth combinations. One that is, is quite, quite um, famous or dominant actually is this um, 44,100 hertz, 16-bit depth. Um, it was, I think, somewhat introduced, um, or often referred to at least as, as the CD quality, so compact disc quality. But since this thing has almost vanished <laughs> these days, um, and also machines got a little bit faster, and, and for many other reasons, um, like this 48,000 hertz, 24-bit resolution, um, is also a, a sample rate, sample depth combination that's becoming much and more, much more like, um, yeah, common um, in more recent digital systems. So, uh, and also, um, I was uh, talking about the sample depth or um, the range of values on the, um, on the um, Y axis, right? Uh, and um, not always, but very often in computer world, the sample range, so the maximum and the minimum possible values of a single sample is represented as floats ranging from minus one to one. Um, there are a lot of good reasons why this is why this makes sense. It's also a reference to the to the analog world where um, this whole notion actually comes from of, um, of having these these waves etc to represent sound. Um, and also mathematically, it's 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 very um, it's very helpful to to oscillate um, between minus one and one um, with the sample. So so uh, with zero in the center. There's another two words or two terms that are very relevant. Also, um, one is the DAC, the DAC, the digital analog converter, and that is usually a um, 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 yeah, a, a single chip, an IC, um, a component, often um, elect electrical, electronic component that converts those digital samples, those numbers basically, into analog, um, electrical, and then audio signals. So, um, and that is basically then used to drive the membrane of a set of headphones, that electrical signal, or to um, yeah, drive a speaker, <coughs> etc. So, so this is this is a very important um, piece of equipment, basically. Often, really super small, just a single chip, but um, sometimes also like a yeah more complex um, electronic device. The digital analog converter it takes a number, converts it into an electrical um, signal of value, actually. And the opposite. So, so that's actually the so the DAC is for output, and the opposite, so the input is the um, is the ADC, the analog digital converter, uh, and that converts an analog um, signal, audio signal, a current, uh, into a, a sample, um, a digital number, 
um, and um, that is used for input. So, for example, um, a um, microphone would be usually with an amplifier. Um, a microphone and amplifier are connected to an ADC, and then and then the ADC converts that samples the um, sounds created on the um, or received by the microphone and converts that into numbers. So these two, this is like the input and the output um, from a device perspective. <clears throat> so next topic, audio processing and synthesis. Um, of course, this is like super, super big and here are just a very yeah, subjective uh, um, set of topics that, um, that I think are, are like a good starting point. Um, so this is uh, um, also these categories, oscillators, filters, envelopes, effects and analysis um, is really very subjective. Um, I've taken this um, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a website where they also organize their um, audio processing contribution in these um, categories, but there's probably many, many other ways to, to address this topic. So let's start with the first one, the oscillator. Um, an oscillator is repeatingly, um, or oscillators repeatingly create signals at specific frequencies. So oscillators are distinguished by the waveforms they produce. The, there are at least four very common waveforms. Um, that is the, um, the sine wave, the triangle waveform, the sawtooth waveform, and then the square wave. Um, and, um, and these, these uh, waveforms, when you send them, or when you use them as samples, when you send them to the DAC, when you use them to create um, yeah, digital music, um, they, they sound of obviously, um, of course, very differently. So the sine wave is very smooth, triangle is a bit more edgy, sawtooth is rather edgy, and the square is like super aggressive, annoying um, sound. Um, I will show or play um, those four waveforms in a, in a minute because it's, I think it's, of, of, of course, really helpful to, to listen to things when you talk about audio. Um, but uh, one or two um, concepts maybe first. Um, so in reference to the, the electronic, the, their electronic origins, oscillators are sometimes still referred to as voltage controlled oscillators. So VCO is a term that can often be, um, be heard um, or encountered when, when talking about oscillators in general. And again, that, that really uh, derives, is derived from these um, early um, like synthesizer, modular synthesizers where, where the um, oscillation signals were created by electronic or electric components. And then they were controlled by voltages. Um, and, and that's where the term comes from. Um, oscillators that oscillate at low frequencies um, low frequency here meaning frequencies that are too low to be heard um, anymore by our ears. Um, that's something below 20 hertz. Um, they are often referred to as low frequency oscillators, LFOs. Um, in a digital domain, most of the time the difference, there's not such a, such a big difference or no difference at all between a normal oscillator and a low frequency oscillator. But again, this is also a reference to the, um, the electronic origins of, of sound synthesis. Then uh, the word, the key term wavetables. So wavetables are pieces of memory containing waveforms or other sample data. Um, in audio programming, wavetables are sometimes used to implement oscillators. Um, that is actually also the case in the example I'm going to show in a minute. Um, there, um, so, so there's like a pre-processed waveform that looks like a sine wave, that looks like a sawtooth, and that is used to create these oscillations. Um, it's, it's basically a sample, a series of samples. So uh, and uh, another interesting um, tool, basically, or concept maybe, is the oscilloscope. So oscilloscopes are used to visualize signals. Um, there are like analog oscilloscopes that take literal, I mean, real electronic um, signals and visualize them on, on a screen. Um, but you can also replicate this, um, this notion of visualizing yeah, a signal over time. Um, you can take this also and, uh, and use this also in the digital domain to, um, to make to understand also visually what's what you're listening to. 
So I'm, I'm actually going to demonstrate this um, with a um, example. I'm not going to talk about the code yet. That's something for later chapters, but I'm just going to run this example and it, um, it uses wavetables to create these four oscillator types I was earlier I was talking to, uh, about earlier. So the first one is the sine wave. Yeah, so it just looks like the um, mathematical sine wave, of course. Then there's the um, triangle, where the waveform is shaped like a triangle. And you can hear already the, the difference in sound. Very smooth, a bit edgy. Then this the sawtooth, and it's that's very uh, it's much more aggressive. And we have the square wave. And they all have very different uh, properties also when you start mixing them and, and using them for, for other things as well. So, um, but these are like the fundamental building blocks for a lot of um, iconic sounds really. And, and the sketch makes use of the, this idea, the concept of the oscilloscope. So what you are looking here, the, the, the shape of the, that you can actually see the shape of the oscillator, of the, um, of the wave. Um, that's, yeah, an oscilloscope, I would say. Okay, the next topic is the filter. And filters are processes that remove unwanted components or features, often frequencies, from a signal. So um, that is also like a more general description of, the, um, of the, the filter in general. So filtering something out means removing something unwanted. Um, and in the audio context, there are three common filters that, um, that are the, the, there are many more ideas and concepts for filters, but um, three very common ones are the low pass filter, the high pass filter and the band pass filter. And maybe best explained in a, in a in a graphic also. Um, so the low pass filter um, here and on the, the, the top one, the top graph, um, is actually filtering out high frequencies of an audio signal. So it, it lets low frequency pass, that's the name, and higher frequencies are filtered out. Um, um, a high pass filter does the opposite, so um, high frequencies are allowed to pass and low frequencies are filtered out. Um, and then there's the bandpass filter, which um, filters um, or lets only a, a specific range of frequency pass and filters out the, the low and the high frequencies. Um, the, um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the frequency at which a filter um, cuts off or filters out frequencies um, whether whether it's, it's high or low frequencies or both, um, um, that that can often be defined in the in the in the as a parameter. It's often a param parameter, um, and another parameter that um, also occurs quite often is the resonance. So that's um, or quality Q or quality factor. Um, the um, the the cutoff frequency that's that's easily described by by this. Um, so basically, you, if you change the cutoff frequency, you would move the line. So if you change the um, in the low pass filter, maybe if you change the frequency frequency to something very low, only very low frequencies will pass, and high frequency a lot of most of the high frequencies will be filtered out, and um, and so on. So so these um, that's that's rather easily explained. And then the resonance is a little bit more um, complicated to explain. Um, so here in this graphic, you can see th this is more or less a um, clean square wave, yeah, with very sharp edges here, um, and the resonance factor actually um, it describes a kind of a um, an oscillation at the edges of the signal. So here you can see it like very nicely as as this kind of fading sine wave <coughs> that is created from by the filter on the edges of the signal. 
And that's, um, that sounds very abstract, but if you listen to this, then it becomes like a rather um, iconic and recognizable sound again. So um, again, like I'm not also not gonna um, talk too much about this um, this code yet. It's something for later. So when I move the mouse on the x-axis, that changes the cutoff frequency. And on the y-axis, um, there is this um, change in resonance. Okay, so this is the low pass filter with resonance. So the next topic is uh, envelopes. Envelopes describe parameters, parameter changes over time. The most common envelope is the attack, decay, sustain, release envelope, also known as ADSR. So um, envelopes are, uh, are yeah, used for as, as, as stated in the, in the first sentence here, um, are used for all sorts of, um, of different um, like um, parameter changes over time, whether it's the cutoff frequency of a filter or the, the volume of an oscillator or amplitude of an oscillator or the frequency um, of an oscillator. Anything is uh, actually like um, possible to, to um, change over time. Um, but again, like the most common um, envelope is the ADSR. Um, that uh, the ADSR envelope um, affects the amplitude or the volume of a of a sound, or often also an oscillator sound. So um, so on the y axis here you have the amplitude, the the volume, and um, the x axis again is time. So um, the ADSR envelope has four stages. They're called um, the attack, the decay, sustain, release stage. So the first um, stage is triggered when uh, when the node on event occurs, and um, so then the uh, the volume is raised from from zero to a maximum volume, um, and once that is reached, that maximum volume, then the um, the decay phase starts. So the um, volume is um, um, decreased until it reaches the sustain level, yeah, and um, and once it reaches the sustain level, the next stage is triggered. That's the sustain stage, and that stage remains active until um, another event occurs. That's the node off event, and once the node off event occurs, and then the release stage is triggered. And that release stage takes the volume or the amplitude from, from the sustain level here um, to zero again. And um, the release stage has this um, specific duration that's defined, uh, that, that it defines. Um, so maybe to explain this, uh, um, why these events here and then the, these different stages, this actually refers to it's it's kind of it's very common also like for example in MIDI um, instruments or something um, something similar. So when you when you think of a comp uh, like a piano keyboard and you press um, a button, that would be this um, note on event. So then those first three stages are like um, are occurring in sequence. So attack stage, decay, sustain, and then the susta that's what's also called sustain because the, the sound is sustained until um, the next event occurs that the, I let the key go and then the node off um, um, yeah, event occurs and then the, the last stage is triggered. So, so that's basically where it comes from. So this, this one tries to mimic um, the behavior of a piano key. Um, yeah, and that's that's what it's good for. Maybe worth noting um, is that the ADSR envelope is described with four values. So attack value is a duration. So how long does it take for, to get from zero to maximum? The decay um, value, uh, the decay um, yeah value is all, describes also a duration. So how long does it take to get from maximum to to this level here? 
But then the sustained stage, that's a, that's a, um, a level. It's not a time, but it's a level. That's why this arrow is also pointing up here. Um, that defines actually like how low the, the, um, the volume will drop from maximum to um, in the decay stage, right? So, um, so if it's very low, if this is a very small sustained value, then the drop is quite drastic. Um, and then the release stage is, a, is, a, is a, the value of the release stage, the release value that is also again a, a time um, value. So that, that value refers to the duration. Um, so how long does it take to get from the sustain level to zero again? So these, um, so the, the first two and the last one is are durations and uh, the third one is a level. Um, there are th uh, two uh, like YouTube tutorials on the topic. I think they explain these for me. They explain it like, really well. So I encourage you to also um, watch them. Um, the ADSR envelope sense tutorial part A and B. Um, but also um, to illustrate this uh, maybe a little um, bit myself, um, there is an, also um, an example I want to run quickly. It's it's this one here. So again, not, not going to talk about the actual source code, but um, so whenever I press a key, you know, the first one, two, three stages are triggered. And when I let go of the key, um, then the, um, the last stage is triggered. So here, here I can manipulate um, now the, um, the duration of the stages, but also the level of the stages. So when I make the first phase um, very, very short, the sound becomes more punchy. Um, and when I make the last stage, for example, very, um, very, very long also, then it takes quite some time for the sound to fade away. Whereas if I, if I make it very short, then the sound just almost like immediately disappears. And here, if I make the attack super long, then the sound takes forever to fade in. And if I, again, like make it like really short, it becomes almost like a percussive. Like a percussive thing. The sustain level is uh, also an interesting parameter and, and useful, but it's less uh, important, especially in the beginning, to, to understand this thing. And so on. And again, the remi reminder that the, uh, the idea of envelopes, of having value interpolated and changed and uh, manipulated over time, is uh, really applicable to a lot of other things, as I said already, for, uh, to filters and effect values, etc. So the next topic is uh, effects. So um, the, the, the um, there are quite a, a lot of effects that that are that can be applied to digital signals. Um, maybe three very uh, common ones, um, of which I'm going to show just one. Uh, one is the echo, um, that is also known from from nature basically. Um, then there's reverb, which is in a way similar, uh, or, or definitely some similarities. Both kind of create the sense of, of of bigger spaces, and then there's the chorus, which makes the makes the sound appear as if it's I don't know, floating, flying or something, and there are many many other effects, um, 
um, there's a, there are entire effect boards and um, and so on. It's quite a big thing. Um, obviously, in for example, guitar in in the guitar player world, um, so there's like distortion and some effect even come in little little boxes. Um, and and are just uh, these boxes are then just able to produce that single effect. So the effect is quite a quite a um, um, like also a, a specific genre of of the um, of digital sounds. Um, but maybe just to um, run one quick sketch here um, to show you the um, the echo effect, um, which I apply. I run through this application and I apply it to my voice. So if I go like bong 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 bong, you can hear that my voice echoes. Okay, these are effects and again like apply to digital audio signals. And then the last uh, topic is actually uh, yeah, it's less of, of the sound, it's, 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 it has less to do with sound production, sound generation in general. It's more like quite the opposite actually, that's the sound analysis, which also happens and is quite feasible or something that's also quite interesting to do in the digital domain. Um, and the, um, the, the, but the idea is that oftentimes the results of the analysis can be used to, for example, um, change parameters of an <coughs> oscillator or an effect or, um, or a filter. So, um, so although this is really like quite the opposite, it's not creating or changing digital signals or audio signals, but it's rather like analyzing those signals that can be kind of fed back into the, this, this whole um, system to uh, inform parameter changes, for example. So, um, <coughs> so um, sorry. So, like three very common um, analysis uh, methods are the peak follower, um, where the um, where the peak of a digital signal is detected over time. So, for example, like the maximum volume. Um, then there's the beat detection, which is a bit more complex, but that tries to detect, like, um, for example, percussive sounds. So, in order to maybe you know be able to yeah, I clap my hands and this is like a, um, a speed which I create by clapping my hands and then have the system adapt to this to maybe, I don't know, trigger note on and note off events to that beat. Um, but then there's also this um, like a very, very um, famous slash infamous uh, analysis um, strategy which is called uh, Fast Fourier Transformation or FFT for short. Um, which basically analyzes the amount of frequencies of different frequencies in a single um, in a in a in a single audio signal. Um, this is a, a magical thing. That's why I said it's call it also infamous because it, on the one hand it's rather easy to use. It's quite um, easy to understand like of what what the results actually mean, but it is really complicated to understand um, its inner workings. Um, but there's a very, very good YouTube video I want to recommend to you if you are interested in um, how fast Fourier transformation works. Um, and that has uh, been created by 3Blue, 1Brown um, and it's called But What Is the Fourier Transformation? A Visual Introduction. So um, I highly recommend that video. Um, it gives a very interesting explanation of how you, you can actually um, um, extract the frequency distribution in a single signal. Um, it's really magic. Anyway, um, but that can also be used, the results of that analysis um, can for example be used to try to find the most dominant frequency in an audio signal. For example, when you have um, a very noisy microphone and then you there's somebody singing and you can try to use FFT to detect the pitch in which that one person is singing. Because there are many other frequencies at play as well, from the noise, but also in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an audio signal in itself. You know, you almost never have pure frequencies like you, like you have when you, like you get when you, um, for example, um, use an oscillator to produce like this one pitch. 
Um, so so um, that's, for example, one, that's one example application of a fast Fourier transformation, but there are many others as well. So this is um, that's a few words on, on the analysis of audio signals. And um, so a few keywords here and there, um, or a few key concepts that might also be interesting um, in, this, in this context. So one is the subtractive synthesis. That is actually um, basically putting those things, especially oscillators and filters, together. Um, um, and also additive synthesis um, um, is kind of the opposite. So basically you have um, signals and then you subtract aspects from the signal or you have um, signals and combine them into, into, um, like into a new, another signal. So that idea of, for example, combining um, using like three oscillators and then applying filters to them to get like this one specific sound, that's this um, subjective or additive um, sound synthesis. Um, the, uh, the, the whole domain is called the DSP, Digital Signal Processing. Um, in this case, um, Digital Signal Processing of audio, for audio, audio signals. Um, but that term is also like really um, important to know um, for Googling things later, or researching things on the internet later, maybe. So, um, and then, the, you can't talk about this whole topic without mentioning modular synthesizers, which is a, um, um, a, a concept, an idea, um, a format, a standard maybe, um, to, um, for, for synthesizers. Um, you might have seen these um, setups where you have a lot of things, yeah, little devices, modules, uh, and they're connected with cables, and you have this huge patch base. Um, and that's, that's how modular synthesizers look. Um, they are analog and digital modular synthesizers, and a lot of the lingo and a lot of the concepts um, in you know, digital music making are inspired by modular synthesizers, but also sometimes the other way around. So it's, it's quite a, there's quite a strong connection between modular synthesis and, and yeah, digital audio programming. Um, there's also the, uh, another word connected to this, the Eurorack, which is basically just a standard um, um, to, to um, yeah, like, almost like a norm, I think, um, for modular synthesizers um, so that they can actually work together somehow. Um, but um, that, is, that is just one important word, key term to know. Um, there's also two uh, books, well, actually one book and one website that are uh, that might also be um, of interest and if you want to dig deeper so the kind of the the bible on the whole thing is um, the computer music tutorial by Curtis Rhodes um, which is a book a printed book um, probably also available as, as a digital version but there, there are a lot of the, the, the like almost everything about um, digital music making is described there and then there's like a, this this archive this website music dsp um, where a lot of very hands-on also sometimes very simple also sometimes crappy but still um, good algorithms um, archived and presented uh, in all sorts of different programming languages um, but most of them in c or c plus plus but that is also like a really good resource to get like an idea of for example, how to implement a, um, a low-pass filter or um, how to get started with simple effects and stuff like this. So, but again, like also really only just two starting points. <clears throat> and maybe also as a, as a um, one of the last uh, things to mention is that um, I'm talking about programming audio all the time. There are many ways to program audio um, but uh, maybe one distinction I just briefly want to make um, or just want to point your attention to is that there's like this big um, two schools of programming audio. One is actually visual based and the other one is text based. Um, I am in this workshop series, I am very much only using the text based approach. So you're basically writing commands and, um, and these commands are then executed um, somehow by the computer, but then there's also this visual approach where you have nodes and boxes, um, um, or nodes slash boxes that are connected um, with cables or lines um, to 
direct signal flow. Um, the, um, there are very famous applications, libraries, concepts um, with, in, in both fields. Uh, and, I'm, and as far as I know, it's still not resolved which approach is better to uh, programming audio, or programming music. However, um, again, like, however, I use the, I am fixated on this text-based approach. And I think there's also some good reasons for both worlds, actually. Anyway, two applications worth mentioning in the visual programming approach are uh, Max, or formerly known as Max MSP. Um, by Cycling74, and um, I would say something like a spin-off, um, Pure Data, an open source project. Um, those two are very uh, commonly used in the if you want to have boxes connected with lines as your programming environment. And then there is the um, the text-based and the text-based world. There's two applications, or yeah, I think it's okay to call it applications like that. That is Super Collider and C Sound. Um, they are um, very, like, been around for quite some time now and really worth looking into. But, um, and this is like my approach now in this workshop, but also in general, is um, there are also um, other environments, programming environments that allow the programming of sound. Um, I'm using processing.org in this series, but um, there are many other um, environments that are also usually come from a visual approach, from a visual, um, or usually designed to aid visual or programming visuals for artists and designers, but uh, can often also be used to create sounds. So I'm using processing here, but there are others like Open Frameworks and um, Cinder, for example, but um, many, many others as well. <clears throat> But that is definitely a very um, long topic to discuss. And also the benefits uh, of both approaches might also be worth um, <laughs> discussing at some point. And here are some audio applications. Um, absolutely incomplete list, but something I think that's on that, that I would compile um, if asked. So there's, um, there's Max, there's Pudata, Supergrader, C-Sound again. But then there are also these DAWs, Digital Audio Workstations. Um, programs that are used to more traditionally, in quotation marks, um, create music on a computer. Um, and then there, in this domain or in this field, there's Ableton Live, which is quite famous, Logic Pro or GarageBand from Apple, um, also Reaper and Bitwig Studios, um, two open source projects. Um, then there's like this very, <laughs> very interesting um, modular synthesizer simulator applications called VCV Rack, where you can um, program and but also use a modular synthesizer on a computer as a simulation. Audacity, you've seen that before, so that is made to edit audio, um, you know, cut and assemble and in a, in, with multiple tracks, etc. Um, and I don't know how to pronounce this, Osen, Ocean Audio, an open source project as well to facilitate the same thing. Okay, and I mentioned this before, in this workshop um, series I want to use a library that, I'm, that I've created for this workshop but also maintaining apart from that. Um, it's hosted on GitHub and it's called Tone. And Tone is a framework for exploring and teaching generative music making and algorithmic compositions. It facilitates simple ways of playing musical notes, facilitates easy access to low-level digital signal processing, DSP, and supplies rhythm and timing as well as some standard musical mechanics, as well as some standard musical mechanics. The library acts as a simple adapter to various sound in and outputs like JSON, MIDI, or C, or analog audio. So what I'm basically trying to do with this library is to um, yeah, give easy access to, to the creation of sound because that is sometimes super complicated if you, if you want to do it yourself. Um, there are a lot of caveats and, and wires to trip over. Um, so the audio aims to make this um, accessible in an easy way and um, go check it out. And as I just read to you, it has three basic concepts. So one is really playing musical notes. The other one is um, processing sound, um, audio processing, digital audio processing. And then the third one is creating rhythm or um, you know, supplying time-based structures. So something, something continuous over time 
a beat. Okay, that concludes the first implementation of the digital music workshop. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned for the next one.